I will be traded to this conference for players yet to be named. Uh, that, that's a little inside football joke. I hope y'all have had some coffee this morning because y'all are, come on now, come on. It can't be that bad. It could be worse, you could be my husband right now. The children began their insurrection at 5.57 this morning. He says, they're in the kitchen foraging. What do I do? I said, just stay in the room and lock the door. <laughs> I'm excited to be with you this morning. I'd like to start with a scripture reading. This is coming from 1 John chapter 3. Verse 11, and I'm going to read it from Eugene Peterson. May the Lord be keeping his soul at rest. Uh, his message. For this is the original message we have heard. We should love each other. We must not be like Cain who joined the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? because he was deep in the practice of evil, while the act of his brother was righteous. So don't be surprised, friends, when the world hates you. This has been going on a long time. The way we know we've been transferred from wife to death is that we love our brothers and sisters. The way we know that we have been transferred from death to life is that we love our brothers and sister. Anyone who doesn't love is as good as dead. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know very well that eternal life and murder don't go together. This is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially and not just be out for ourselves. If you see a brother or sister in need and you have the means to do something about it, but you turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears, and you made it disappear. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know whether we are living truly and living in God's reality. It's the only way to shut down debilitating self-criticism even when there's something to it. Verse 21, and friends, once that's taken care of and we're no longer accusing and condemning ourselves, we are bold and free before God. We are able to stretch out our hands and receive what we ask for because we are doing what he said, doing what pleases God. Again, this is his command. To believe in his son, Jesus Christ, who told us to love each other. This is the word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> so the title today is, Do You Want to Be Healed? Do you want to be healed? Now I realize that some of you are probably thinking, oh no, here comes the diversity lady, and it's Black History Month, and we're going to hear all about diversity. I know it's okay. You're going to be fine for two reasons. One, my back is killing me, and so it's not gonna be that long. But number two, we're not going there. We're gonna ask the question, do you wanna be healed? 
One of the things that we need to consider as a church right now, as the body of Christ, is the significance of the season that we're in. We are in a season in which entire state legislatures can't function because there's no leadership. We are witnessing a stalemate between people who should be leading us but don't want to talk to each other. We are living in a season when the body of Christ would rather sue each other than sit down with each other. Oh, come on. I, it's, it's Saturday, y'all. We might as well just tell the truth, if nothing else. Today, I could do a happy, clappy kumbaya. But let's just be honest. Most of us, every time we turn on the news, want to know what's happened next. Teachers abandoning their posts to do unsightly and unseemly things with children. Pastors pilfering from the pockets of their congregations, destroying the trust of the people. Hatred breaking out openly in meetings and workplaces. We've gotten so desperate to connect with each other that people are swiping right or swiping left to find love. We are in a terrible season. We are in a season in which the question is, they, somebody would ask Dion Warwick, probably would, where is the love? Where is the love? I wish that I could tell you that the church was a shining example on a hill for love. But my bank account would say it's not because I'm spending money to go to St. Louis to ask the same question. Where is the love? Where is the love? So friends, when we last gathered, when I gathered with many members of this conference, I offered some insights, some things that I thought at the time was true. The first thing I said was, you can't transform the world if you can't speak to the world. And if you can't speak the language of the world, then you can't do anything with the people with whom you share the world. If we can't speak each other's languages, I argued, then we're not going to be able to communicate with each other. That was the first brilliant thing I came up with. So I said, you, you can't speak to a people if you don't know their language. You can't speak to a people if you don't know their language. Then I said, we live segregated lives. We live segregated lives. Oh, we come together, we put all kinds of graphics together, but we, we really live segregated lives, I argued. We speak and work with each other, sure. But when we go home, usually the people we invite into our house, the people that we socialize with, the people that we deal with, the Facebook pages that we look at, really are the people who look and think like us. Therefore, the likelihood of us learning how to speak other people's languages is reduced because the only languages we're hearing are the ones that we speak. The last time I was in this conference, I said that traditional diversity and inclusion training is terrible. You can quote me on that. 
It's terrible because it doesn't help us deal with the reality of the fact that we live our lives in tribes. We live our lives in tribes, and our tribes have these unique languages. That our tribes are not just the color of our skin or the gender we're in. Our tribes are our class and our generation. At SMU, we have five generations on our campus. Five. We have the silent generation, the baby boomer generation, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. Try being in a faculty meeting with that. We don't like each other and we think we're all, we think we're right and they're wrong. So traditional diversity training, I now forever give you a pass. I know what the conference is going to say, you don't have to do it anymore. I think the reason why I think traditional diversity and inclusion training is ill-equipped is because as human beings, we're always going to navigate toward our tribes. We're going to navigate, you know, when I come into a room of clergy, I'm looking for the deacons. Come on. Laity looks for laity. Elders look for elders. And then we have to break it down to the sub-tribes. The people I like who went to my same seminary or the people who share my same ideology. I've been to annual conferences, certainly not Texas, but I've been to annual conferences where you could tell the political ideology depending on which side people sat on, but I know that doesn't happen here. When we talk about tribes, I said, tribes are these social divisions that we break down, it's class, it's religion, it's, I, it's our ideology, it's, uh, it's where we went to school, it's our geography, I'm a southerner. The inside joke, Tony, is that the tribe I belong to is the greatest sorority in the world and the tribe that Michelle belongs to is one who's trying to so try to be like us and she's coming along, and they're coming along, uh, and we pray for them daily. <laughs> but these tribes, whether it's the football team that we cheer for, we're in tribes. Houston and Dallas are in tribes. I have students who are from Houston who only sit with Houston students. The H-Town crew. And then the Dallas crew, and then the Plano crew. So we have these tribes because it's elemental to the way that we organize ourselves as human beings. One of the great books that I've read and I recommend it to many people in this conference was one by Joshua Green from uh, Harvard. And one of the things that Joshua points out is that because we sit in tribes and because we tend to think our tribes are the best tribes, we always can see harm that's done to our tribe. We, all, we can see it. We're like, see, they just treated us wrong again. They never mentioned the deacons. We're part of this clergy too. Or they, see, they take laity for granted. They take the music ministry for granted. They take the children's ministry for granted. That's when we're talking our tribes. The other thing is about tribes is we never can see when our tribes have done anything wrong. Like, who us? You must have misunderstood. We love everybody. The other thing is we believe that the worldview of our tribes are righteous and informed. We've studied the issue. This is the way it is. We never can conceive that people on the other side or in the other tribe may be informed as well. The truth, my brothers and sisters, according to me at the time I last talked to you, was we see reality through the lenses of our tribe. 
The truth of the matter is I see reality through the lenses of a Gen Xer who is in her early 50s, quite bitter about it, but it beats the alternative, who is from the South, who is a mom of three, late in life. I, this hair was not this gray the first time I came to you. I see the world as a college professor, as a deacon, as someone married to an elder. These things shape the way that I see reality. My particular Christianity as a follower of the tradition of Wesley makes me see the world a particular way. And the truth of the matter is I tend to relate to people based on the tribes I belong to and the stories that I've created for them. So it's easy for me when I am thinking about my colleagues in other disciplines to say they don't get it or they're hard-hearted or they're uninformed or they are stupid or they are ignorant or they are evil. Because I've created a whole story for them since I can't speak their language and don't know them. So in the absence of their story, I tell my story about them. Friends, tribes actually are quite natural. It is the way that we have been built to organize ourselves. But what's not natural is giving in to our tribal instincts. Does that make sense? I can belong to a tribe, I do belong to tribes, but our natural instinct in a tribe is to defend our tribe and fight all other tribes. I don't have to give in to that instinct. I don't have to. I don't have to. I don't have to. Because the thing that I said last time I was here was that we all just need cultural intelligence. If we were all culturally intelligent, life would be good. If we developed the skills and the knowledge of each other and learned each other's languages, we would be okay. That's what I said. Did I not say that? I said that at the clergy reading. I said that's all we need to do. I was brilliant. I said, if we got culturally intelligent, I know I said this. I said, if we emphasize learning each other's cultural languages, we could make this a game changer for the church. We could stop being the tail and be the head on issues of inclusion. I, I'm telling you, this is what I said, this is what I wrote. I probably got two or three raises off of this. I'm serious. I'm serious. I said, this is the key to reconciliation. If we would just learn from each other and learn each other's languages. I, you know, really, I could just drop the mic and walk off. I even said, particularly to the clergy, that if we became culturally intelligent, it would be as if we were moving from the Tower of Babel to Pentecost. Because what I said was, I said, the Tower of Babel separated us. The gift of Pentecost is that it brought us together so that we could speak new languages. That was deep. I think that was really my best stroke of genius right there. I, I, I just went around going, we must move from Babel to Pentecost. I mean, it sounded good. I was like, I even, I even told my book publisher, that's going to be the title of the book, Babel to Pentecost. It sounded good. I even, these were some of the pictures I was thinking about for the cover. I was, I was like, this is it. It even looks better up there. So I said, let's just learn each other's languages by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we can truly be the body of Christ. Woohoo! Yeah, 
That's all we need to do. Yeah. No. It's not as simple as I thought to move from Babel to Pentecost. Uh, I was sitting, getting ready to preach at St. Luke in this conference. And Michelle, would you mind grabbing me a chair? Because my back is killing me now. Uh, I was prepared to speak and to preach and talk about, uh, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate that. Uh, Y'all will forgive me if I sit. I'm short. It's not like it was looking that good today anyway, so, you know. Uh, the thing I would say to you, my friends, is this. So I'm sitting in my hotel room trying to struggle for this sermon that I needed to give at, uh, at St. Luke. And wanting to do it the way I told you all these great points I had made, and I realize that, number one, Houston has sort of become Damascus for me. It's always where God and I seem to meet. Now, don't get excited. It's just me. But the Lord said, you're missing something. He said, I don't have time for you to talk right now. I've got to write a sermon. There's important work going on here, God. I'm doing your work here. Now be quiet. But the Lord's like, you have simplified this, and this is not a simple process. I think we want a simple process. We want it to be easy. It's like losing weight. We keep looking for that magic pill, that magic diet that will do it, and, and that we'll be able to lose weight while still simultaneously eating chips and salsa, chocolate cake, the occasional aguave mixed beverage with salt. Oh, I forgot. I'm talking to Methodists, not Baptists. Uh, the occasional wheat-based drink with ice served neat. Uh, that's, that's the Methodist drink. Uh, we're, we're always looking for that quick thing, and I think what God was calling me to is that I was on the road of trying to sell you something easy. And so I apologize. I'm not giving the money back, but I do apologize. Because what God explained to me was that I was missing a crucial step. That I wanted us, and I believed I could, move higher. But you can't move higher if you're missing a step. What you do is you just fall on your face and hurt yourself. One of my favorite stories is the story of the man by the pool. And at a very dark time in my life, Alice McKenzie in her office sat and told me this story in her own Alice McKenzie way. And I was complaining about something and something that had been bothering me for years and, and I kept saying, well, it's never going to be right and I'm never going to, and she said, D -d 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 let me tell you the story. And for those of you who may have forgotten this story, Jesus was one day walking by the pool of Siloam. It was a pool that was known for its healing power. People from all around the area came to this pool because it had principles of healing power. See, this is where the problem is. You got a bad back, but then you get excited about the gospel. 
so we'll just work this out. I'll be doing squats before it's all over. The people knew that if they could get into the pool, when the water was troubled by the angel, whatever ailed them would be healed. And so this particular day, Jesus is walking by the pool and he sees a man who had been sitting there for years, a man who was lame. And Jesus walked up to the man and said, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Now, what's fascinating about this story is that Jesus saw someone in a condition in which they were not healed, and Jesus asked a simple question, do you want to be healed? If you remember the story, the story says the man began to explain to Jesus, he began to explain to the answer. You, you sort of think about how silly that is. He begins to explain to the answer of his prayers, his condition. Well, you don't understand. Every time the water is troubled, I can't find anybody to get me in. And he begins to go on this long litany of things and Jesus just stopped and said, See, this is why I'm convinced Jesus had to be black, because I know he was just like, <sighs> whoo. Do you want to be healed? See, Jesus, all that, uh, yes, I hear all that. Do you want to be healed? And, and I would argue that we are finding ourselves much in the same position as the man by the pool. Friends, every year since we've been on this continent together, we have battled with the question of why we don't have reconciliation. Why can't Blacks and whites be reconciled. Why, why can't the Hispanics and the Asians understand each other? The truth of the matter, the real truth of the matter, the real truth of the matter is be, we don't have reconciliation. We don't have reconciliation between conservatives and liberals, blacks and, people, and, and other people of color, whites and people of color, men and women, gays and straights, southerners and northerners. You know why we don't have reconciliation? It's because we don't want to. Come on now. We don't want to. We don't have reconciliation. We don't have bridges built between each other's communities because we don't want to. The scripture is kind of clear. This, this is what it says. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we were once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We have a ministry of reconciliation, yet we're not reconciled. Therefore, comma, we don't have reconciliation because we don't want to. I'll sit. 
because I want you to hear what I'm saying. The reason why we're fighting, the reason why we can't get along, the reason why things are torn down and torn up is because we don't want to be reconciled. The premise that I'm arguing for is if we are truly saved, as we say we are, and we've been given a gift of reconciliation, and we're not supposed to be looking at people according to their worldly look, i.e. their tribes, and we have been given a gift of reconciliation, then I'll ask you, why aren't we reconciled? I'll wait. We're not reconciled because we don't want to be. We don't want to do that work. We don't want to make that change. The truth of the matter is it is easier for us to continue to lay by the pool in a broken state convinced of our own righteousness than it is to give up our arrogant belief and get in the pool. Tony, they're very quiet. We are sitting by the pool, convinced of our own righteousness, our own tribe's righteousness, our own worldview's righteousness, our own, come on now, race, gender, sexuality, our own righteousness. We want other people to get in the pool, but we don't want to get in the pool. If they would just get saved, if they would just love like they supposed to. Friend, I want you to think about whoever you view as your antagonist, whether it's the liberal, the conservative, the black, the white, the Asian, the immigrant, the young or the old, whoever it is, you know what you've said about them. This would go better if they would jest if they would get in the pool. Somehow we're convinced we don't need to get in the pool. So we're not reconciled, and I would say this, we're not even healed because we'd rather give Jesus reasons why we don't want to be healed rather than just taking Jesus' hand and truly immersing ourselves in the waters of transformation. Okay, you don't have to like me, I'm just saying. So the question, my brothers and sisters, this morning, as you go through all of these workshops this morning, is this. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Because at the end of the day, God has already, if we are saved as we say we are, if we've already embraced the provenient grace of God and we've already experienced the saving grace of God, are we not yet able to experience the sanctifying grace of God? I'm sorry, that was a little Wesleyan. Wesley believed, I believe righteously so, that it's one thing to be saved and a whole nother to be sanctified. I think we have a whole lot of saved people. We ain't got a whole lot of sanctified people. We have a whole lot of people who said, Lord, I believe, but we have a whole lot of people who will not get in the pool so they can be sanctified. I am never going to question whether any of you, any of us, love Jesus. We just don't want that kind of love for ourselves. I don't want to have to forgive. I don't want to have to understand. I don't want to have to go to that neighborhood. I don't want to have to understand their point of view. I don't want to have to consider that they may be right. It is easier 
to stay ticked off than it is to reach across the aisle and try to find a way forward. It is easier to stay in my house with people who look and talk and believe like I do and talk about them rather than get my butt in the pool so I can see them as God sees them. We don't have reconciliation because we don't want to get in the pool. We don't want to get our hair wet. Because if we get our hair wet, our minds might get changed. Friends, it takes courage to get in the pool. It takes a willingness to recognize that we cannot love as 1 John has said we should love unless we get in the pool. So the reason why we don't have the love manifesting even in our churches is because we're not in the pool. I was telling a group of seminary students and I was telling them the difference between solving a partial problem and changing the system. Many of our churches have food banks and I praise God for that. But rarely does the church engage in attacking the reasons for hunger. See, it's one thing to deal with the fact that I have a terrible back. It's another for me to take my happy butt down to Baylor Scott White and go get an MRI to see what's wrong. I'd rather just take the Aleve. And that's what the church has been doing. We've been trying to alleviate ourselves of our responsibilities to change the world. Again, you don't have to buy it. I'll just put it out there. We have no power as a church because we have no love. We have great songs. We do good works. But we cannot show them the love of Christ because we're not able to even show it to each other. How many of you are sitting next to somebody you don't know? At least on one side, a couple of y'all. I'm just asking. When's the last time on your Sunday off, those of you who are lady, we can take Sunday off anytime we want. I tell my husband all the time, I'm a deacon. I'm supposed to be in the world. I don't have to be at church. I need to be in the world and see what the people are doing. So I'm going to the original pancake house to see what the people of God are doing. <laughs> have fun at church. Make sure the children go to Sunday school. I'm going to do research for God while I order the bacon lovers. How many of us really spend time going into the community in which our churches are situated? When's the last time you've walked your neighborhood and knocked on doors? I know some of the driveways are long, but you could get your 10,000 steps in. When's the last time you've done that? When's the last time you've been to the high school football game in your neighborhood, even though you didn't have a child playing in that game? Brought by the fire department? The police department? Hello? When's the last time you sat with someone you knew you had nothing in common with? The question is, do we really want to be healed? Here's the last thing that God gave me when he was interrupting me as I tried to prepare for a sermon. God said, there can be no Pentecost till you get in the pool. So we have, I believe as a church, been proclaiming Pentecost power when we haven't even gotten wet. We've been sprinkled. Some of us recovering Baptists have been dunked. 
but we ain't stepped into the pool. We haven't truly been transformed. This is the kind of keynote that is designed for you to think about you. You can't learn, I can't learn other people's languages until I'm willing to step in the pool and admit that I need to be cleansed. Until I realize I say some horrible things in the name of love about people that don't think like me. I post sometimes crazy things to Facebook about people I don't understand. I actually had one of my students call me out about this, which was powerful, but they're a millennial. That's what they do. And this is what she called me out about. She said, you realize you have a thing against millennials. I said, no, no, I, I think y'all are nice people. I think you're our future leaders. And under my breath, I said, heaven help us. <laughs> but the reality is, I knew my whole attitude. I hear myself sometimes. I hear myself in faculty meetings. I hear myself, and I didn't want to admit that they annoy me. But I forgot that when I first got in the academy, I annoyed the baby boomers. I didn't want to deal with my own stuff. Because after all, I'm the cultural intelligence lady. I'm supposed to love everybody. But the reality is, I didn't want to sit with my own stuff. I realized how often I was dismissing an entire group because I felt they weren't up to my standard. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I do it to baby boomers, too. Oh, my fellow Gen Xers, let us be honest. We often say, when are they going to retire? They are holding things up. They are shutting things down. They are taking up all the resources. If they would just retire, we all would be better off. But no, they're holding on to power. I know it's not you, it's just me. But there are black folks who will never believe that a white person can actually care. Will never cut their Hispanic brothers or sisters any slack. You see, that's the, the thing about the pool, is the pool is quite democratic. Small d. I know this is Houston. If I was in Austin, I could just say democratic and it would just roll, but. See, the pool calls all to it. The pool knows that we all need to be healed. The pool does not see one group as naturally imbued with goodness. The pool sees that we all need to be saved and to be washed. There is no way that we can serve the world until we get our house in order. Too many things are being done in the name of God that don't look any parts of godly. Too many things are being said in the name of God that don't sound anything that's godly. They have, they, it looks nothing like what we see in the word. And if I may be so bold, I've already been bold this morning, so what the heck? The pain pills are kicking in now. My biggest frustration right now with the Methodist Church is that we actually 
have a message that can transform the world. Now, I know the Baptists think that and the Catholics think that, and I think we all have our role to play. But we have a message of social and personal holiness that says we have to be present in the world as a part of our holiness. That John Wesley said, I can't preach to you if you're hungry, if you're in debt, if you have no home, if you have no love, if you need health care, if you need education. I can't keep preaching to you about heaven until I do everything I can to make heaven come now. Our world, our country, our neighborhoods need to hear that message, and we spend most of our time fighting each other. I have a good friend of mine who uh, works for a major newspaper and was telling me that they're going to be in St. Louis for our general conference. And he was making quite light of it. He says, we get to do this all the time. We get to go watch another church implode. That's our witness. Our witness is not one of unity. Our witness is one of graceful exit. Friends, I'm annoyed with everybody on every side. No, I'm, 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 I'm tired. I just really, I see students who are looking for a reason to believe and stop taking heroin, and I can't provide it for them. You have families in your church who are dealing with an opioid epidemic. They're dealing with parents with dementia, children with ADHD. They're dealing with all kinds of stuff, and we are about to spend millions of dollars to go try to figure out how we can get along. Friends, we have empowered this foolishness because we have failed to get in the pool. We have come to see each other as adversaries, as impediments to our will, and impediments to the way we think the world should work. I'm sorry, I don't need to come to church for that. I could stay and just watch Congress if that's the way we're going to do this. Come on now, what's the difference? What is the difference? And when I have to ask, what is the difference? Then that's a sad state because I've given my life to the church. And I'm not the only one who's sitting in this audience asking, what's the difference between us and the world? I do believe that our Savior is looking at us right now and saying, what's the difference? Which is why God is calling people who are outside of the church to do the things the church should be doing. God is going around us. God is going around us. Look at all the social innovation that's happening all across the country, all across the world. God is empowering people who we said didn't have two pennies to rub together to do fantastic things. Why? Because the church won't get in the pool. Finally, the church has political power and we've lost all Holy Ghost power. I digress. And I'm sorry. But I truly believe God is calling me and you to get in the pool and get over ourselves to be reconciled. Maybe it's time to learn Spanish. Babel has a great app. Maybe it's time to listen to Cardi B, our new founding mother. Don't hate, I listen to Cardi B. It's a 
bomb. I love Cardi. Maybe it's time to listen to Fox News. Maybe it's time to watch MSNBC. Maybe it's time to invite that person that you don't agree with to lunch and view them as one of God's children and hear their story rather than their position. See, that's the difference. Everybody's got a story. Tell me how you negotiate life every day. Tell me the last time you did something that excited you. See, once we start listening to each other's stories, then we can see each other as human. We can get in the pool if we're willing to hear a story. We can get in the pool if we're willing to recognize that everybody has a right to speak and everybody has a right to be heard. Friends, I will just end with this. Do you want to be healed? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you'll notice on your um, schedules for today that Dr. Hall will um, have a continued conversation at the 11 o'clock hour back here in the sanctuary. Uh, please know that if you're going to We Love All God's Children, it's that way. Um, if you are going to the youth, uh, it's that way. If you're going to trustees, finance, SPRC, it's either way downstairs. If you're going to the single board model, it's that way outside the door. There are refreshments all throughout. Um, thank you for being here. We hope that, um, again, God will speak in a mighty way. Dr. Kemper, would you just miss us in prayer? Well, let's pray together. Well, Lord, you've spoken to us, and we're grateful for those words. We're uh, repentant of our complicity and all the things we've heard about. Uh, we pray, Father, for your Holy Spirit to come and to work around us and in spite of us, but hopefully through us. In the name of Jesus, amen.